one this week, uh, the third one in about the last three weeks or so. And uh, as you know, uh, it takes a lot of work for these volunteers to put these programs together, to get the speakers to organize, to advertise, book the room, uh, uh, you know, make all the arrangements, cook the meal, and uh, transport everything here. And so uh, we uh, want to thank them very much, all these volunteers, for all their hard work and, and uh, putting together these wonderful programs. We've been having the last two tonight and the other night. We haven't had as big of a turnout, uh, and I think that it may be that there's there's final exams going on now, or huh? Midterms, midterms exams are going on. But anyway, uh, those of you who are here are very fortunate, uh, and it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce to you Goranga Das, who's from India. He um, is a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology, which uh, many of you know is uh, you know, something like India's MIT or Caltech, a premier technical institute in India. Um, but uh, rather than take the career path of going into a lucrative engineering or science career, uh, Goranga Das decided to uh, take vows of renunciation and celibacy and to dedicate himself to um, uh, spiritual culture and to educating the world of and India's spiritual culture and uh, to uh, the practical application of the principles of the ancient Vedic scriptures of India uh, to contemporary life uh, in a practical way. He's on the board of directors of a um, Govardhan eco village in India where um, the um, residents, it's a farm community where residents demonstrate uh, how one can live a healthy, happy, culturally enriched, uh, spiritually enriched uh, life in an environmentally friendly way, in a peaceful way, and um, also involves not only um, having a, a great way of life for the residents of the community, but he, uh, Goranga is involved in the budding field of what we call a spiritual tourism, of making an opportunity for people to come, stay at the village, and uh, learn how things are going on there and learn and take away things, uh, spiritual things for themselves. Not only uh, people from the West interested in yoga and Indian culture are coming, but also um, uh, people from the hectic, stressed out world of corporate management within India itself are also learning a great deal from uh, Goranga Das. And uh, also people from I understand from the medical fraternity in India, cardiologists, radiologists, neurologists are uh, not only taking uh, advantage of uh, learning about meditation and spiritual uh, wisdom, but also uh, consulting on issues of medical ethics, contemporary issues from a Vedic perspective, bioethics and, and other uh, cutting edge uh, issues. So this isn't just some um, ancient, you know, yoga thing that's not, not related to the modern world in any way, but it actually has lots of practical applications, scientific applications, to the way we all can live our lives in a happier, more stress-free, um, and more fulfilling way. So, uh, please welcome Goranga Das. Thank you very much, Guru Nath Prabhu. And uh, I'm grateful to the organizers for inviting me this evening. And uh, the, the topic I've been given is Art of Happiness. And just by looking at a Guru Nath Prabhu, you can <laughs> you know, get an idea. You know, here is someone who's happy. And 
then we would like to know what does he do to become happy. Since he's too humble to speak, so I will speak <laughs> on his behalf. On what has he done that he has become happy. So I will speak from one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which is an ancient text spoken at a place called Kurukshetra in India. And uh, some copies are here. And uh, the temple leadership here, especially Vaisheshika Prabhu, is very uh, expert in explaining the essence of the Gita. And I believe you have classes and courses going on here on the Gita. So, the first thing which people want to know is, how is this knowledge or the talk relevant to me in my life? Because most people are willing to accept something which they find is useful for their own life. So the first thing is we have to establish the relevance. So as of today, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, this book which you see, in the last uh, 45 years has sold close to more than, you know, how many million copies. If you go on the website, you will see that. Millions of copies have been sold and unless something is relevant, you cannot expect it to be sold year after year, decade after decade. So people are experiencing a transformation, a change in their life. And therefore, how this Bhagavad Gita and the knowledge in this is relevant to us. So I will discuss one shloka from the Gita and explain its meaning and establish its relevance in creating happiness in our life. This verse says, Yam labdhva chaparam lanam manyate nanikam tatar yasmin tatona dukhena guru napi vichalyate. Can you decrease the echo? So this is a very simple verse just to show you that the Bhagavad Gita has the power to create transformation in our life based on application. So this verse says, Yam labdhva chaparam labam manyate na adhikam tata. So what is the state of, you know, what is the achievement which we are looking for? Everyone in this world is looking for achieving something, right? If you ask somebody, why are you studying? So yes, I want to get a degree. You know, why you, why you want to get a degree? I want to achieve a status in society. I want to achieve some success. So everyone is into the achievement mode. So the Gita is explaining what is the highest quality of achievement. Amongst all achievements which you can hope for and hanker for in life, what is the highest achievement? You know, right now, I was involved in the process called benchmarking. So when you want to improve a, a particular corporation, you know, you do benchmarking. That means which are the other companies in the same field which are doing things better or similar. So you have something known as, you know, uh, generic benchmarking or you have internal benchmarking, you have competitive benchmarking, depending on which way you want to go. So. If we are in the field of achievement and we want to figure out which is the best achievement or the highest achievement which will give the, the best qualitative experience to us within. So therefore, any person who wants to improve his life must be willing to benchmark. Like there are corporations which are doing things in their own way since thousands of years. Right? And they may not want to improve at all. So even if you tell them there are better processes, better opportunities, better ways things are being done, they are not interested because, you know, they just feel that the way we are doing is the best. So, even in corporations, you can only inspire them to change when there is a desire or a will to change. Like if someone says, I know, you know, Apple is doing great, I know Microsoft is doing great, but this is the way our company functions. It has always functioned this way. It will continue to function this way. We are not going to change. We have taken a vow. 
we will set our own standards, you know, like that. Like for example, I was sharing the story that when I was in IIT, one of my friends in IIT tried to commit suicide. And uh, he tried to hang himself with a rope from the ceiling fan. And he survived because the rope broke. <laughs> you know, sometimes it happens in India. Rope is not good quality, it breaks. You know? Sometimes they try to commit suicide by drinking rat poison. And I know some people who survived because it was duplicate quality. <laughs> and one guy tried to commit suicide by sleeping on the railway track. And the train was late by three hours. <laughs> he got frustrated, he said, this is too much. This is a place where I can't live peacefully nor die peacefully. So, I asked him, what's your problem? Why are you so frustrated that you want to commit suicide? People want to get into IIT. So he said that, I'm always used to getting, you know, a gold medal. And I've never allowed anyone to defeat me in my grades. But somehow, in this exam, I got the silver medal, this guy got the gold medal, I can't take it. I said, Baba, millions of guys are waiting to get into this college. And why are you so frustrated with this? So then I found that four or five of my other friends, they failed in three, four subjects. And they were moving around the campus blissfully. <laughs> Blessing everyone. <laughs> Giving the philosophy of Gita, Karmanya Vadikarati Mahapadeshu. Be attached to working, not to the result. So I asked them, this guy, he is trying to kill himself because he couldn't get a gold medal. And you guys are, you know, going to repeat the course, three or four of them. You are flunked in your subjects and you are moving around the campus blissfully, going to parties, watching movies and, you know, socially being so active. You are not feeling ashamed? You know, you are not feeling we got failed, we got bad grades, or we are, you know, we didn't, we didn't actually do the way we should have done. You don't feel bad about it? Our philosophy is getting into the college is our job, taking us out is college's job. <laughs> Why should we be anxiety? <laughs> so, when we, when we speak of benchmarking, we are speaking of a concept where there is a willingness to com compare our current state, whether it is of a corporation, of a company, of an organization, of processes, with other much more established and successful examples then only the process of benchmarking can begin. Right? You want to improve. You are willing to face the reality. Okay, these are the other organizations who are doing much better. And what makes them get there? What makes them come there? What makes them...